Few Americans know that during the Korean War, Soviet pilots were flying Soviet jets on behalf of North Korea with the full knowledge of the United States. Today on Roundtable Perspective, Austin Carson joins me in examining that secret war and other secret wars where governments engage in conflict with the tacit agreement of their enemy in order to avoid escalation. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Austin Carson, to discuss secret wars and international conflict. Welcome to the show, Dr. Carson. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Dr. Carson is an assistant professor in political science at the University of Chicago. He studies secrecy and international relations, and I think we'll spend most of our time talking about your book that was recently published by Princeton Press last year, Secret Wars. Um, covert conflict in international affairs. So it may not be the first thing the American citizen thinks about, the U.S. involved <laughs> in secret wars, but um, what's your approach with this? Yeah, well, so the original idea for the book came when I learned um, an interesting anecdote about the Korean War, uh, early 1950s, which was that um, publicly the story about the war was that the U.S. was fighting with allies uh, against uh, the North Koreans and the Chinese. And it turned out that neither the North Koreans nor the Chinese had an air force or trained pilots to speak of in that uh, part of the, the early 50s. And so uh, the Soviet Union had to provide the manpower to fly planes, and they did so covertly, secretly, without public announcement, um, and went to great lengths to try to conceal uh, the role of their pilots. So from that, I said, I, I want to understand this aspect of conflict, and I wonder how, how many other conflicts in which there was a, a major power participating um, in some way or in some dimension without publicly announcing So you say uh, secret, but it certainly wasn't secret to the Russians or the Chinese or the Koreans, and it wasn't secret to the U.S. It was just secret in terms of public knowledge or public awareness. That's right. But the U.S. government, military, knew that this was happening, and obviously the Russian military knew that's what right. was happening. So. And that's, that's when, you, when you work on secrecy, you, you have to be careful to define who the audiences are, who's in on the secret and who's out of the secret. And one of the overarching themes in all of my research is that there are, the secrecy is never an isolated island-like effort. It's always a, a collective in some way. And so, yes, in that example, you have your allies like North Korea and China who certainly know your pilots are flying those yeah. planes. But the most interesting part of that um, episode was that the United States through its own intelligence collection methods, had figured out that the Soviet pilots were flying the planes. Interestingly, they had anticipated that. Before the, the pilots had enter, entered the war, they said, the Soviets are going to stay out, but if they come in, they're going to come in quietly, and they're probably going to do an aerial role, because they knew just as well as yeah. the North Koreans and the Chinese did that they had no air force. So it was something they were looking for, and they found it. And then the question turned from, why did the Soviets get involved quietly, to why did the Americans stay quiet about it as well? And that's where the collusion element of, of the book uh, is developed. And that, that was interesting to me because when you're, when you're writing about it, it appears that if, if both sides know this is happening, but they're not going to talk about yeah. it because it, it would suggest if you put it on the front page of the New York Times, Soviets flying in Korean yeah. War. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? <laughs> so there was right. a, there was in a I don't know, a tacit agreement? Did you find that there was actually exchange uh, of information? Because to collude is, suggests... Kind of an explicit yeah, yeah, coordination, yes. right? So I use the phrase tacit collusion a lot, okay. um, precisely because in that particular episode, I never found evidence of any communication or explicit coordination between the Americans and the Soviets. I did end up looking at, in a different chapter on the Vietnam War, I did end up finding some explicit discussion between the Soviets and the Americans about what the U.S. was doing secretly in Laos, uh, neighboring Laos, um, to try to disrupt the transport of men and material uh, into South Vietnam from North Vietnam. And the, the Soviet um, ambassador in one meeting, uh, we, we now have declassified records that, that show this, um, approached uh, the American, uh, and I think, national security advisor and says, you know, hey, we know what you're up to in Laos. Can you basically knock it off? And it became one of these rare instances where most of the collusion in the book that's discussed is a more tacit, yeah. 
uh, form. This was actually explicitly discussed, uh, which I found interesting. When you say tacit, there must, even a tacit agreement means that we've got an agreement. I mean, we may raise an eyebrow or... Sure. I mean, is this... Um, to be able to say that it's a tacit agreement, is it through diplomatic channels where there's kind of coding or phrase causes that uh, suggests like when we say we're not going to let your ambassador or your staff leave the country or enter the country. Right. It's not a big, but it's interpreted as we're not happy with what yeah. you did. Yeah, so. sometimes you have like coded language or euphemisms that allow you yeah. to, to approach but not directly engage. There's some of that in the book, although sometimes you know I classify as a tacit form of collusion one in which there is no even implicit verbal kind of acknowledgement of it, but one in which both sides clearly understand the other one knows what's going on, and both sides oftentimes anticipate that the other one has its own reasons for staying secret, and um, kind of bake that into their decision making and how they're approaching the situation. In that case, I, you know, I've, I sort of view that as a form of tacit cooperation, although... And, and when you're talking about the uh, Soviet Union and the United States in the 50s, we're talking about the beginning of the Cold War, exactly. but it's still well established, so they've had relations in Eastern Europe right. and in, in other parts of the world where the, where the Soviet Union has yeah. kind of stated what it was going to do or acted in a certain way, and That's the right. U.S. responded in a, in a certain way. So there kind of is an awareness of what this means. Yeah, exactly. And interpretation. There's kind of a, a, the, a key theme in the book is exactly this issue of a track record and a history and a series of prior experiences that help you anticipate what the other side will do and, and in some cases explicitly relate it to yeah. concrete episodes. I found uh, a telegram uh, on the American side which explicitly compared what uh, China and the Soviet Union were doing in the Korean War to something that had happened in the 1930s and tried to relate that to this pattern of behavior um, which related to their interest in you know, stirring up trouble but keeping things relatively limited. And so it feeds into the story I build out in the book about escalation dynamics and using secrecy and non-acknowledgement to try to keep a conflict uh, so active the, but so not escalating. So the collusion was not simply you fly your planes, we fly ours. I mean, obviously you're putting individual pilots and, and soldiers at risk because they, I mean, they got to fight the other person and that's there's right. going to be deaths and destruction. That's so right. that, that's at risk. But the other thing that's at risk is um, what, what you're suggesting is the collusion goes so far as we don't want this to escalate. So we will tolerate what you do, you tolerate what we do, and it's almost as if it's a public show that we're standing up against communism and they're standing up against U.S. imperialism, but right. it's only yeah. uh, almost uh, boisterous, um, sort of well, not even that, it's even just a show. Of, yeah, it was a kind of, yeah, I think there's... There's actually a, a running metaphor I use in the book is about the stage, actually, uh -huh. and the roles each side can play in these kinds of conflicts where I, I see this secrecy dynamic emerging. And um, that's exactly right. What, what this sort of tacit secret agreement can allow these two sides to do is not look too weak right. and look like they're standing yeah. up for their interests, for their allies, for their ideology. Um, but neither wow, probably wanted a full-scale war. That's I mean, exactly right. right. It's kind of like the later the Bay of Pigs, which wasn't so secret. But sure. neither side wanted something to escalate, and this is—it's like a kind of a test. But we're not going to push it because we don't want to know what the outcome is. Because, I mean, to escalate that between the Soviet Union and China and right. the United States, it becomes a very dangerous. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, in a, in a world with nuclear weapons yeah. and modern industrial conventional armies, um, a, a wider regional or global conflict, I think, on both sides was viewed as ruinously destructive and in, in neither side's interest. And so there, that was sort of the, uh, the context that uh, led to a bunch of different interesting um, and, and tragic features of the Cold War but one um, that in particular led to this interesting secrecy dynamic where each side wanted to keep conflicts limited yet also wanted to pursue the, their interests yes, and, their, and yes. their friends at, competing, at a competing level, um, but using this tactic that, um, that I describe in the book does, to keep things Does this require the, the, the secret wars that mm -hmm. you're talking about here, does this require that the, uh, those engaging in it are relatively um, equal in their military Capabilities, because I mean, when you were talking about this, the tacit agreement. Yeah. I think the Iraq War, where Hussein mm. 
his understanding, his tacit agreement with the U.S., it would be okay to go into Kuwait. Because mm -hmm. he, he actually met with the ambassador yeah, at Glassby, yeah, right. and she said, yeah, we have no interest, and then he did. And it's yeah. like, no, or, or I'm thinking now with Erdogan mm -hmm. in Turkey, sure. s interprets the withdrawal of troops from the border right. as a tacit acceptance, but that could easily yeah. have backfired on him, like you, the Turkey comes in and you say, oh, you shouldn't have done that, and now you've violated all kinds of humanitarian yeah, right, guidelines. Right. So is it is it the requirement that the that the powers be relatively powerful? I guess. Yeah, I think I don't I don't strictly speaking say that that's a requirement. Although I do think it it oftentimes becomes one, uh, you know, in practice. What I think both sides need to have is um, a shared uh, interest in avoiding a larger conflict, and that could be true if it was some sort of um, tacit agreement to behave in a certain way between a large power and a smaller power. In this power. case, Turkey and the United exactly, States. Exactly, right. So, so there's, as long as there's shared, a sort of shared view about the danger of escalation and the process by which escalation yeah. in this context might take place, then I think you have the conditions for it. It just happens to be that oftentimes, especially in the chapters I cover, these are major powers and that tends to produce a similar outlook on yeah. the way a, a conflict getting out of control would be ruinous for, for either side. Yeah. One of the things you're suggesting with the secrecy here is it avoids um, increasing conflict. Mm -hmm. Does that translate to, to one of the claims? I think uh, Admiral, the Admiral that gave the report for SOCOM to Congress said this was to avoid larger <laughs> conflict. That was his explanation right. why he needed funding and uh, permission to go yeah. into to Mali <laughs> and where they've where have they gone? Sudan, Yemen. Exactly. And yeah, the argument Africa, the yeah. argument sounds similar to this is that let us do this secretly, it won't get out of hand. We'll be able to quell the thing and we'll avoid a larger escalating conflict. Does that have any transfer? Is that way I, out of? To be completely honest, I think there's a slightly different story going on there. First of all, I think of those as covert operations, as you said, not necessarily secret wars, but you know, relatively isolated peacetime um, special operations missions. Um, maybe they are during uh, some sort of like insurgency, but the purpose to me seems to be primarily about counterterrorism and counterinsurgency on behalf of local partners to address uh, possible terrorist organizations and training areas, for example. Do you example. think that there's the special ops has the tacit or the official agreement of the country involved? So that, that, so that I do think is similar. And, there, yeah. and oftentimes there's an agreement to look the other way. An example of this that came out with some of the WikiLeaks cables that were leaked about 10 years ago was that the US was engaging in drone strikes, I believe it was, in Yemen. Yes. And they had acquired the actually explicit consent oh, that, that Yemen then, would yeah. claim credit as if it was their military yeah. operation uh, as a way for them to not look like they had outsourced to yeah. you know, the big bad United States. Um, and, and so that was in, in their interest in that sense. So these kinds of tacit agreements to stay silent can emerge in these counterinsurgency, counterterrorism contexts. The thing it lacks which is, I think, really important to the particular argument I lay out in the book, is another side who can, who can participate in an escalation process. So if you're engaging in counterterrorism operations in Mali, it's not clear who exactly is on the other side There's no who you real fear. Threat to, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's probably more for your, uh, uh, more for your public image at home. I think right? that's part of it, or the local host government, just like with Yemen. The, yeah. the Mali government may not want it advertised in their own local media sphere. Um, that these operations are taking place. It can be very controversial just to host American troops, let alone host active combat operations. And so it could be something as simple as that, as sort of the local government giving consent in return for you doing operations that are a little bit outside of public view. There may be an agreement on uh, yeah. what the target is. Right? Yeah, right? The that's right. The political yeah. force in Mali or Syria or somewhere else may want to particular target or oh, particular sure. outcomes. So they're- I'm sure, they're, yeah, they've, they've got skin uh, in the game too, so it's, yeah. it's- But there's no countervailing force like there would be with the Soviets in Korea. Right. There's no countervailing. It's more the, uh, whatever the geopolitical uh, intent of the sure. particular operation at the time. I think so, and I think, um, I mean, I think the, the alternative example that I do think has contemporary relevance uh, for, for what the book lays out is, is a conflict like Syria where you do have you know, major regional powers mm -hmm. um, in Iran, Saudi Arabia. You also have outside powers like the United States, Russia, who were involved in a very complicated war, a war which some did worry and, and still do worry about turning into a, a larger regional conflict. And in that case, I think there, you know, there are these same kinds of escalation concerns. 
Um, and you know, secrecy is used for a bunch of reasons, um, as the book clearly lays out. Actually, didn't uh, did, well in this case, it's Russia, no longer the Soviets. But didn't 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 uh, I vaguely remember there was some U.S. wanting to go to the western part of Syria, but they were going to bump up against Syrian yeah. forces in Russia. So they kind of alerted. I think there was a command. Yeah, there was like a deconfliction arrangement. Right, to we're going to avoid. You, yeah. We're letting you know we're coming to bomb this city. Please don't be there when yeah. we get there. There was. It seems like yeah. there was a lot of that. There was also an incident I actually wrote about in the in uh, the Monkey Cage uh, Washington Post blog about an incident when the <clears throat> these were Russian contractors not Russian military personnel per se, um, but they were, uh, they came under fire from American forces. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the reporting said as many as, you know, 100 or, you know, uh, more uh, uh, were injured or killed. And um, what it seemed like was both, as soon as that incident happened, both the Russians and the United States worked very hard to, to emphasize the, the, exactly, yeah. to de-escalate it, to emphasize that they were contractors, not Russian military personnel. And to uh, keep things, you know, essentially under control, and, and some of the some of the techniques seem pretty similar to some of the ones I develop in the book. Um, another contemporary thing that I'm thinking a lot about, in light of, of some of the stuff that I researched in the book, is cyber conflict mm -hmm. and cyber operations, where um, a it's lot has been. It's much easier to keep that secret. I would assume. It is <laughs> right, and, and some in some ways, it's it's almost the default is is to not sort of advertise who engaged in. A hack and, and disabling operation, or uh, you know, infiltration well, and extraction of information. Uh, if, if you raise an alarm, it suggests you have a weakness here. Ah, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. Certainly don't want right to say that you were hacked. You could say, well, you should have hacked me. Right. But to say that I've been hacked suggests that you have more capability than I do. So there's almost a. I'm right. Not, I'm going to try to stop you, but I'm not going to even. Uh, Say out loud that exactly. you did this. Yeah. So it's it's easier to keep that sort of both the res, both the initial attack and yeah. the response in this sort of like unattributed um, covert cyber realm, which is I think where a lot of the action is right now. I don't yeah. think we in, in the public know nearly really the tip of the iceberg of what's been going on, and it's in both sides' interest in a lot of ways to keep it contained in that sphere and to avoid creating political pressures or external pressures that could take some of these sort of back and forth, tit for tat activities and make them into something larger. And so that seems to me like a similar kind of collusive overlapping interests in the perp for the purposes of engaging in competition, but at the same time keeping it under control. It makes me think like when the, uh, the Venezuelan power grid went out because yeah. there was a cyber attack of somewhere, right. to think that the US was involved is not a far-fetched conspiracy activity because we know that Israel's done that with Iran, sure. for example, and um, so I, was, I would not was, want to slide all that way, no, but, but to suggest this happens suggests that there's uh, real reasons why secrecy exists, to, both to keep it, um, what, to collude with the enemy, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. and to keep both publics. Um, yeah, removed. I mean, I, I I agree. You start jumping at shadows if you if you think too much about the, <laughs> yes. the the sort of collusive element. But you know, just you know, on the specific Venezuela example, I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility at all. There was New York Times or Washington Post reporting on U.S. Um, cyber operations targeting Russia's energy yeah. infrastructure. Um, so to think that they couldn't do the same thing to Venezuela, of course, of, of course, that's a possibility. And secondly, if you're thinking about, you know, what are my options in a bad situation if you're the president and you're presenting those options to the president? You know, one of the things I, I talk about is, you know, covert activity of any kind is just uh, on a spectrum of, of yeah. options from sanctions yeah. to o over yeah. military strikes to some kind of overthrow operation. And time and again, in my reading of American modern foreign policy history, that covert option seems pretty appealing because it, it sort of insulates you from some political and strategic downsides of other options. It's more than just slapping some sanctions yeah. and you know wagging your finger. Um, and depending on how it's being sold internally, it might be able to potentially achieve X or Y or Z objective. Now, these things oftentimes don't work. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. sort of a question I don't really get into all that much in this is, is they work to control escalation in the way I describe it. But do they actually get the job done of what the, the program's supposed to achieve? Yeah, if your that's goal is intervention, not de-escalation, th then it's that's a whole right. different question that, of absolutely. how valuable uh, some secret activity absolutely. is. Absolutely. And it's quite tricky to, to think about what success is. Like when you think <laughs> Stalin intervenes in the Korean War, is he 
deploying his pilots to win the Korean War? I don't think so. No, Is he doing so, it to yeah. avoid a loss? Yes, in which case, I actually think it did exactly what he wanted it to do. Yeah. We don't want to slide into that, but my whole read of Stalin was he really wasn't in interested in global expansion, but more of a status quo in most of the places where there were conflict. They weren't as explicit or, I guess, yeah. uh, tacit as you suggest here. Sure. But I think the U.S. was fairly well on historical solid ground that he's not going to go any farther than what he's done and that, yeah. right at this moment. And I so. argue, yeah, in the book I argue that looking, you know, just getting beyond Stalin, I agree, we don't want to go too far down that, but Stalin and other leaders, I have a chapter on the Spanish Civil War in which the Nazi Germany regime is one of these intervening yeah. states. Yeah. And, I, and what I argue in the book is when you look at what they're doing covertly, you get a different story. Because if you just look at what Hitler does in 1939, it's obviously yeah. a, a uh, a big, very aggressive uh, play right, for power, it, right? right? Yeah, in, in, in domination of Europe. When you look at what he does covertly a couple of years before that in Spain, you see a very different Hitler. Now, he's, he's trying to avoid this becoming a large European war before Germany's rearmed. He's carefully watching what the British and foreign uh, capitals, how they're reacting to his involvement, because he doesn't want to have a war too early with France or the British. And it shows you this more conservative, it's still an, you know, an aggressive act to intervene covertly, but a level of caution that we don't always associate. Two, two, two things seem to have changed since Nazi in, in Spain or sure. the Korean War. One is uh, it's harder to keep things secret. Yes. Um, and the second is I wonder if the political stage, yeah. as you call the stage, yeah. has shifted. So there are so many covert activities mm -hmm. that are on the front page of the New York. They will say covert activity by the U.S. and Niger, four Americans died. Yeah. Well, how is it a covert activity if it's on the front right, page of the right. New York Times? So right. these, the suggestion that this is partly diplomacy, partly uh, saber rattling also suggests that there may be some uh, normalizing or naturalizing for the American public that sure. sanctions, military options always on the table. Right. Yes, we can do this. You don't, wink, wink, you don't know <laughs> that we did. I mean, Israel's very good at that when, they, Absolutely. when they've attacked someone and then they say, no, we didn't do it. But it's, right. it's, so is there, does that shift what you've found, do you think, to the extent that something may not be as uh, uh, covert or secretive yeah. as it might have been? 50 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. This, this was something I struggled with from the beginning of the book, was, was how is this not going to be an interesting historical footnote? How do I make this useful and relevant in a period which I think all of us agree that it's harder to do things secretly than it was 50 years ago? So uh, I do that in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, one of them is by explicitly looking at this concept of an open secret and thinking about what, it, what, it's, what is its role What's in this it's, whole yes, yes. Uh, process. And what I end up explicitly incorporating is a couple early kind of predecessors of the, the front page covert program. So with the US, as I mentioned earlier, covert involvement in Laos, which was effectively secret for a good three, four years. Yeah. And then in, um, by the time the Pentagon Papers and, and anti-war protests were really going strong, um, it started appearing you could on read the front about pages. The secret war exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now what I ended up finding is that uh, a different mechanism to which, uh, uh, when, it, when it becomes an open secret, through a different mechanism, it can still achieve the same goal of de-escalation. And the reason is that uh, the American diplomat that was managing this program in Laos told uh, the White House, uh, a national security advisor, he said, the Soviets essentially feel they, if we admit what we're doing, even though it's like being widely we reported, admit, and, right. but if we admit what we're doing, they then the Soviets have to, have to do something. Yes. If it's out there and it's somewhat ambiguous and we haven't admitted it yet, it's just enough of a fig leaf for the Soviets who actually didn't want they to go into last. They to, can actually to say, say okay, don't do this or we will respond. But exactly, they actually but they don't have, have to. to. That's right. And so there, I, I sort of developed this idea that there's a sort of signaling value in even after these things get, get exposed in avoiding acknowledging and admitting what you've done. And precisely because it's implausible, precisely because everyone knows about it, but you're still sort of, again, on the stage, pretending and playing your role of not being involved, of not having intervened or whatever, that shows the other side, that you're still very interested in keeping things under control. One thread that ran through this when I read about Korea or Vietnam, mm -hmm. if we're talking about Laos or we're talking about Venezuela, it's, it's almost like a game of risk. Yeah. Um, and the diplomacy and for international relations, it's uh, extremely important to understand this. But the, the missing thing is, is the citizen, is the Absolutely. people of the world. Because whatever it is, there's people dying, suffering, 
um, limited in their choices, and that's uh, that's an overarching yes. uh, thing that isn't often taken into consideration, I, uh, particularly by the policymakers. Yeah, I, I mean, a hundred percent agree, and by the book. <laughs> let's let's be honest. <laughs> let's, let's not just pin it on the policymakers. Um, the in the book, I. Number one, don't talk very much about the local actors who are partnering with these outside powers yeah. that are intervening. Um, and number two, the, you know, I call them limited wars and avoiding escalation, but for the people where these wars are yeah, taking a place, war they're brutal, they're, right. they're deadly. Yes. Um, they can be killed or, or hurt, their family members have been. And in a way, the particularly tragic element of this is that by uh, conducting this secretly, a lot of times it doesn't, force you know, the, the, the US public or other uh, uh, publics in powerful states to really come to grips with what's right. going on. And to ha have an influence and take some action. And Absolutely, and maybe they wouldn't do anything. Yes. Maybe they'd become yes. endured to As them. interesting as this is, we yeah. could probably have another conversation. We'll do it in secret at another point. <laughs> I'll that's, all, that. <laughs> that's all the time we have now. Uh, thank you, Austin Carson, for joining me on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts, see you next time. Mm -hmm.